it is Advent in Sheffield in 2020. Like no Advent we have known, we are in the midst of the unexpected and the long anticipated. Last Advent, the pandemic was only a distant rumour from China that did not appear to have any consequences for us here in the Steel City. We noted with bemusement the Chinese students wearing face masks on our streets. As for the long anticipated, we've been waiting for four years now, waiting for the Brexit that split the city down the middle to become a reality. It is almost here. Will it be what some dreaded and others hoped for? Nobody seems to know. We are a city with many hard stories. Remember that wonderful public information film that features at the beginning of the full Monty, Sheffield, a city on the move. Our identity was then stripped from us, just when we seemed we were in our prime. Our cutlery was at the dinner tables of the world, then Orgreave was followed by the Hillsborough disaster and we were infamous all of a sudden. And yet our corner of the county proclaimed its defiance as the Socialist Republic of South Yorkshire. Our story is full of wounds and triumphs. On July the 1st, 1916, the Sheffield Pals Battalion moved out of the woods near the village of Sare. By the evening of that day, 513 officers and men were dead, wounded or missing. We remembered those men and their families from those same streets of Sheffield on Western Avenue in crooks by planting lines of trees. So many families have stories of the factories and the apprenticeships served by so many. When it all went wrong and the furnaces dimmed and died, we looked to the markets to save us and they gave us Meadow Hall and call centres, shiny temples to the service economy. Some of us began to see strangers on our streets, strangers with different faces, strangers who were destitute. Asylum seekers coming to the steel city sent by faceless bureaucrats and abandoned to their fate. Not for long, as kind and radical citizens worked themselves into a lather and raised every penny they could to give them shelter. A cyst was born of this endeavour. A cyst birthed in anger that any human could be treated with such contempt. The corridors of Victoria Hall echoing with offices and folk ready to help. A city of sanctuary was born and spread across the country. We started to tell a new story of thousands of students coming to our sloping streets and instead of the lines of workers filing into the moors of British steel, Firth Court and Pond Street welcomed youth from every corner of the globe. Shops and cafes began to fill our streets, Ecclesaw Road, Abbeydale Road, West Street, Division Street 
and our squares and precincts busied. We signed a 25-year contract with a multinational company to finally fill those potholes that jolted us into the millennium. What we didn't realise was that they would start to cut down our glorious trees, including those that we grew for the soldiers who'd left an empty place at so many tables. Campaigners came out of the woodwork and blew vuvuzelas, decorated the trees, got arrested, hugged the great trunks of limes and beeches, oaks and cherries. We saved them. But now the streets have fallen silent. Closed signs in lockdown Sheffield. We clapped in the bright spring sunshine for the NHS, the Hallamshire and the Northern General as they filled up with Covid victims. We've had to keep our distance, to stay apart so against the Sheffield grain. Even the carols that would fill our pubs, old songs with solid Yorkshire tunes will not fill our lungs this year. The great hymn of Advent will have to be whispered from house to house, candles in windows and hearts quietly yearning. O oh come, O oh come, Emmanuel. The great plea for the divine to find a home with us, for God to become a vulnerable and tender child and show us the way again to harmony, to peace, to generosity. Upon our journey give relief and close the path to pain and grief, goes the fifth O Antiphon. In this exhibition, in these poems and photographs, we'll hear the stories and feel the wounds of our city, and we will sense the city waiting. We will hear, as Dylan Thomas says, the big seas of our dreams, and listen and watch for the approach of new life and light in our dark winter solstice. And we will walk again towards hope. The hope nestled in her mother's skirts on Tofts Lane, or Twentywell Lane, or Barnsley Road, or Spittle Hill. Hope that our sad divisions will cease, and we will become bearers of peace in this, our city of sanctuary of steel, of golden trees, of heartfelt people, surrounded by green peaks and stony edges. Prologue to a traipsing. I stand, conduit, with the flowing road that runs down from Stanage, out of the mass trespassed moors. Above Ringinglow, I watch as the dark Tar River issues into wet yet rapidly sunburnished Sheffield. I stand, conduit to expectancy of a wandering a gritty itinerancy, tramping the damp road 
mirroring the flow of my near sixty years, the city filling my wind-gloss sight, ready to enter an unsteady future. I stand conduit at a confluence, the deep seams of ore and ire, my history in factory shutting Sheffield, and Maltby, striking pit, pounded, distant in time and view from here, moribund hinterland to steel's grave. I stand conduit to uncertainty, boxed in by old streets, echoing, seeking a way to walk the city, to write the pages of present days, pad blank with unknowing, a loosener for tongues tied up by being ignored. I stand conduit to make a start, more than a maudlin requiem or a sad and mawkish oration, well packed with an earshine of listening, walking on to meet the newly arrived and the left behind. I stand conduit to a troubled hope, in search of the sliders who slip between marrow and bone, those whose viscous honesty and anarchic incursions rupture all that tight-limbed electoral thinking. I stand conduit to these first steps, to tread the valley-riven streets with fresh boots. The peaks rain, wetting my resolve to walk a poetry of traipsing, to write a flow of treading, to transcribe tough the unalloyed lines of a retold city. A German Cross July the 1st, 2016 Western Park, Sheffield Standing stock still to recall a hundred years A small platoon of young recruits Boots on tar The Ramadan fast felled one Falling backward As his faint brought gasps and a paramedic. I stood with them, first footing the July sun, nestled in my hand a given crucifix, from Keith, who works the quarry by my home, an artefact of grace in my appreciative palm. Its lineage traces back to a wounded German who gave it to his grandfather on the Somme. Keith's sons, unmoved by old religion and wars, causing him to offer me this pinioned bequest. It crossed the lines, this smooth rubbed figure, portraying in miniature the tortured boys, Sheffield pals, and Saxony's sons, whose death is gripped in this fear-polished and crucified body. The past crosses over us in Western Park, in a schoolgirl's poem of the unreturning. The boy revives, unlike his predecessors, who have only memory to hold them here. Does this cross, a wounded metaphor, a lamb in the endless slaughters, a broken saviour, have any meaning for all our freshly slain in Aleppo or Nice, Baghdad or Bataclan? 
the Muslim boy still falls in my memory. Like thousands that fell a centenary of Julys ago. Can a man's fall stop the monstrous angry guns? If I gave this cross to him, what would he see? An endowment of faith or a tribal emblem? Fear and prayer have rubbed the figure smooth. The trembling fingers of men under fire, fingers that touched as the cross crossed the lines. The boys and girls march past the mayoress. I walk away, feeling the cross in my pocket. It still whispers that only in the fallen's clemency and our embodied mercy will all these years add up. John Speddings, Steel Worker, 1947-2017 to 10,000 long days I have rang you, and all for an untimely old age. Joseph Senior, Smithy Rhymes and Stithy Chimes. The face he sets to the world fall short of the man he used to be. And yet the steel he worked is still visible, assayed and tensile in his stainless steel stare. The drop forge's dirty process has filled his lungs. By shifts, earlies, lates and nights, with the slack and slough the searing breath of the furnace. We sit in his living room, his dark mahogany tea in our workman's mugs. As we look at his photograph of the black hole of Calcutta that was Turton Platz's River Don works, looking like an old master in satanic oils. It were great, he tells me, when we were Sheffield owned, but we ended up bought and sold in the hands of Australians and then the Yanks. This man's fate sealed in Sydney or Pittsburgh. Four mates work the forge, gauging with precision the moment when the great concussion would press out another cherry red buffer that would slowly harden into brazen steel and keep the trains apart. Some men died, three during his service. It's dangerous stuff, steel working, he says, in the deadpan nonchalance of his ilk. But you should have seen us leaving work covered in muck and muscled. I lost three stone when I were an apprentice. He has been a buffer too, between the life of steel forged, hammered into his frame, the constancy of dropping, casting his life to its contours, and his family, shielded from it all, sitting around his woodhouse table. The heat has withdrawn and the workshops have fallen silent. Just this listening, a taking in, an absorption of a face, a form, a man uncertain now in the city he built, the city centre, 
an alien world not visited. What honours do his kind receive? When is his medal ceremony? The life he gave is unnoticed. Except by me, in this drinking of tea, and by his friends, by his family, and it's not enough, not nearly enough. Sheffield as I see it. There are cobbles on Sheffield streets, under the tarmac. They show through after a while. A grain under the crumbling smoothness. A pattern, discernible, steps from the past. And the cobbles covered other tracks. Grass-worn lines of homecoming, revisiting the ways that we have always travelled. Time dilates and contracts, and more so as your years yomp toward their ending, when you feel the crinkling of memory on streets familial through years of friendship. Under the city's skin, veins of remembering, some varicose and sclerotic, flow, slowing, yet others are still vibrant and richly arterial, skeins winding the past to weave this present. Old-fashioned signs persist, fading adverts for firms long gone or sold on, and the old gas lamps gutter smokily, the shadows on the glass a lamentation. They burn methane from the sewers, a remnant of Victorian ingenuity, at the junction of Union Road and Brincliffe Edge, still lambently flickering. They remember the great war elephant Lizzie, she lugged steel around for Tommy Wards and needed boots as her feet were sore. Asked the cobbles. They still feel pity for her. And you can see, if you look up on West Street, the old names and tiles of the pubs now clubs. The Hallamshire and the Saddle. The West End. Obsolete now beaten back by profitable chains, yet still a residue of toe-capped revellers, apprentices and turners, grinders and little mesters. My apprenticeship on Pinston Street, Ray Allen Man Shops and up Chapel Walk. I can still smell the coffee from Pollard's and wear in my mind my Afghan coat from Pippi's that smelt like a dead sheep if it got rained on. Now all that can be seen is the redevelopment on the other side of the road and the old hulks of shops no longer needed mouldering away. That's what I see. What do the Saturday night students and the Friday nightly town painters see? Because the streets belong to them now. The old whispers muted, only for those whose ears are still attuned to their fading intimations. There are ghosts on these streets as well. The Sheffield Battalion, their boots in step on memory's parade. I can just hear their rhythm passing the town hall, as can the doorway sleepers, catching the betrayed hopes of a somme morning. 
The street sleeper's days are a slower attrition, relentlessly wearing lives away, eyes dulled by a chemical fix that stopped working, taking teeth and hopes as the Levites pass by on the other side. The big issue is a Samaritan's donkey, but there are too few wound binders to cope. I find a man in a sleeping bag reading under the red stanchion that once housed the Gourmont Cinema, and my memory travels out along the shop-lined road to the Abbeydale Cinema, domed, dirty white, and James Bond with Grandma, or the ABC where Jaws attacked us, and the studio five, six and seven, paint your wagon a wandering star under the wicker arches. Getting the 24 bus into town with mum and grandma, the castle market, all the butchers knew them, and I got a paper bag full of broken biscuits. The stalls, a shouting of the odds and a bustle of women with bags open to three pounds of spuds, my jeans came from Harrington's Clothing Emporium. Grandma lived in a sheltered housing on Wensley Court. I've been there now. It's sheltered no longer. Burn Grieve is tougher today. And Fir Vale is where I help out at the food bank. The streets around and about are home to many unsheltered souls. These streets have assisted those who are escaping from ricocheting bullets, unfree thoroughfares where the soldiers steal more than just possessions. A night shelter for asylum seekers in Christchurch, Pittsmoor, and the shop there with everything, halal butcher and fresh fruit and veg and foods from all around the world, the sign proudly proclaims to all and sundry. These streets, where bombs still echo in the ragged architecture, in the abrasive soul of masculine steel, the shadows of Atlas and Vulcan still cast themselves into our sense of who we were and who we should be. Containments like the old crucibles piled up beside the millworks in Abbeydale's industrial hamlet, shaping us still. And then there is the rain, channelled through the city in lovely rivers with names from antiquity, Loxley, Rivelin, Sheaf and Don, and the brooks, Burbage, Blackburn, Mearsbrook, Shirebrook, Porter, Wyming and Totleybrook, and the old hay, the water goddess Danu presiding over us all. We are flooded at times, the great flood of 1864 taking 270 souls, and in 73, the year my dad died, and now regularly the water gushes down. I hear it as I walk through the Rivlin Valley, finding its way past me in hundreds of channels, above and under the ground. The city draws breath after these inundations, as it did after the catastrophe of Thatcherism, trying to see above the parapet and find recovery from a mutual breakdown. And now new students come and find us building up and breaking down, creating new streets from the crumbling cobbles of the old. This is a city where you can live your dreams and not go bankrupt. A young man and his wife once told me, and I think I still believe them. Seeking Asylum Asylum, noun, shelter or protection from danger. Oxford English Dictionary The interminable turning of wheels 
and the passing flashes of lights in windows, the utter unknowns of country after country. Travelling is like brokenness, each border a tearing, wrenching us further and farther from anything we can recognise as daily. All we yearned for was world service land, for green English squares where you can bat all day and Dickie Bird would umpire fair play. But it all led here, to trash-ankled railings, the unswept streets of Burngreave and Pittsmoor, a night shelter to our traumatised cases. Here, the umpires hide in opaque offices, and they don't play fair. They demand evidence that nestles in the bombed-out buildings of our nightmares, in the eyes of our children who grip our hands, in yet another meaningless cue, in a language we are just getting our lips around. In a time-worn corridor, we found people to assist us. Kind-eyed strangers who heard our submissions helping us to tell our story in such a way as to be heeded, the unpacking of luggage that we carried unacknowledged. This city became our sanctuary, these people our refuge. Their daily bread became ours, and our daily bread fed them. Dedicated to Sheffield, the first designated city of sanctuary, and to assist who helped to make it so. The Furvale 5000 It happens every week on a Thursday in Fir Vale, at two in the afternoon. A long column forms and bustles out from the door of St Cuthbert's, an old barn of a church with no pews, instead cafe-style tables and volunteers. When Jesus came ashore, he saw a large crowd. He felt a deep concern for them. A barrage of need shuffles through the doors, rifling and rummaging in the masses of old clothes, four items each, and numbered tickets for bags of food to be collected at three. Modest basics, little sacks of tea or coffee, to keep someone going for a few days, subsistence provision. The faces are resting, testimonies in the eyes. Rough to listen to, even tougher to live. Easy to snap judge. Each a litany of difficulty. May the hungry pray for us. May the sanctioned pray for us. May the old pray for us. May the immigrant pray pray for us. May the alcoholic pray for us. May the universally credited pray for us. May the broken pray for us. May the gambler pray for us. May the asylum seeker pray for us. May the battered pray for us. May the lonely pray for us. May the anxious pray for us. May the depressed pray for us. May the schizophrenic pray for us. May the disabled pray for us. May the excluded pray for us. May the Roma pray for us. May the labelled pray for us. Seventy or eighty weekly souls, each with an admixture of this litany in their lives, disposed to sit together. Dissimilarity raw to navigate 
a fractious multitude sharing a meal, hot and vegetarian, cooked by the voluntary. I heard a disciple say, This is a remote place, and it's already late. Send the crowds away, so they can go and buy themselves some food. Jesus replied, They do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. What are we doing here in this food bank, in which deposits are given away, no questions asked? Making a meal of it, because the safety net is full of unmended holes. The transaction is blurred for me. We do feed them ourselves. Yet I am just as hungry. I, too, am a subscriber to this litany of difficulty, volunteering to gain some amnesty from my own issues. Taking the five loaves and the two fish, and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke the loaves. This is a place where all have suffered. Refugees from the unforgiveness meted out nonchalantly by a system that has forgotten why it was created. The breaking of the loaves is the space in which we meet, the shelter we seek. The wreckage of faith all around, broken too, run aground, a rumour of kindness now. The great building's deterioration is testament to our ultimate unsalvageability. Yet we still congregate every Thursday to pray this litany of difficulty, reciting sweet imprecations to the hands that break, calling down a blessing on ourselves, the thousands of fractured souls, with our sequestered pains, showing reverence for the trodden miles we travel in anonymous solidarity. Sheffield, born and bred. They sit side by side at the food bank clothing giveaway. Jason and Sean, with bags of cast-offs at their feet, like two old kings with booty from recent conquests. They were at the same school as me. We remember the same teachers, Mr Cartwright caught us smoking. Mr Solway's chemistry, another deputy head with a cane. In my white way, I ask them where they are from, noting their dark skin and hearing an outsider note, a concoction of somewhere eastern with intoned Sheffield. Sean smiles, used to it, and invokes their Iranian father, an Afghani mother. Their parents were Parsi, Persian. They've brought photos because I took an interest, asked questions. Black and white, Lord Litchfield, camera in hand, visiting the steel city, and Sean is with him an apprentice turner. Shafts of gleaming steel behind them, British steel era, the boiler suits contrasting with the royal photographer, camera slung on his shoulder, the lens that framed Diana. Other photos are produced, 70s flares and motorbikes on the snake pass. Cricket, Tinsley, Steelworks team, Jason, a batsman, Yorkshire champions in the Sheffield Telegraph. 
Where are your families? Are you married? I asked, curious about these two brothers who shared my school life. No, they demur. We live here, in Page Hall, single, together. These two men laugh in their memories, around us, bringing others to our table talk. The bowls refilled, love your soup, they tell me. But where are you from? I can't help myself. The words seep from my unconscious. They smile forbearingly at me. We are Sheffield, born and bred. Bird song on long line. A straight trudge uphill, framed by a rainbow, mirrored in petrol spilt on the black road. The aperture in the sky, a summons to pay heed to this mile of evening. Then there is the long swash of gleaming cars, the undertoned trundle of tarmac tyres. The human sign demarcating the start and a request for motorised slowness. A welcome yearning for careful drivers that seems to go utterly unheeded as I shrink into the moss bound verge, a pleb to the passing of a royal. There is a Roman straightness to this road, a monosyllabic duality dissecting the fields bracketed by hedgerows and the generous robustness of trees. In the pause between Porsches and white vans, their parenthesis audibly bounding the green silence, I am able to hear a bird take up its garrulous singing. Now my attention has been sensitised like skin after weeks in a plaster cast. I am defenceless against the utter hopefulness of the feather-born chant. I want to interrogate the singer's song as my body bends low to the constant incline and a bead of sweat snuggles down the stoop line of my spine like a mouse. My questions are caustic, corrosive, I want to scald this long line, stooping, into an answer, into yielding meaning to this walk, to prize out an explanation. Instead, I just notice the sunlight captured in the silent panes of a house, its goldenness like an uncertain broadcast, dying in the arrival of dusk's cold. The long line is coming to a dark close. Sheep Hill Road teased the walk's long straightness and the tree framed by a sapphire backdrop to the farm where an allotment once flourished. The lack of beam poles in the overgrown patch witnessed to the absence of the old man I had once watched bending his own back to painstakingly dig in the new manure. A sleek throat sounds against the early dusk, a last verse to these long lines of walking, and my heart welcomes this reckless chorus, hopefulness beyond my walk's ending. Fishing in Loxley The Tench, the physician of fishes, 
is observed to love ponds better than rivers. The Complete Angler, Isaac Walton, 1653. Arise just beyond the reach of my cast, its ripples extending in the summer water, warm in its serenity, and then the weighty plash of a decent fish. I have been here from early doors with the old hands of this lake, sitting with these people of steel who tell stories about life in the dark factories of the Don Valley. And still the fish flashes its iridescence just below the surface, summoning me. I feel a settlement in the exchange between my hands and the rod and the line, between the world that awakened me and the pools I fish when I sleep. Under the waterline, a narrator is speaking, relating the tales my life has garnered. I drift through them like the reeds the fish graze through as I coil my gaze at the float. The widening ripples collide with others spreading from these discarded grafters left behind in eddies and old backwaters where the water has become stagnant and dank. The smooth body of a fresh plot line courses past my place and leaves a momentary score finwise across the surface of this still water. I strain to grasp what this holds for me as I cast again toward the next rise with its demand for me to fail and fail until it all comes together and the float dips and drops and my rod bends with the fight of the fish and I feel the weight of its disclosure, its energy travelling up the line and through the rod and into my straining hands. And I slide the landing net under its belly and tenderly lift the beauty of scales and fins and motion with reverence for its birth from the water and not the earth. Finally, I hold in my upturned hands a new story born of these old waters. I sit in the sheen of this tench, whose flanks carry legends of healing, in the roomy eyes of these tempered souls, in the broken windows of the derelict factory whose industry this lake once served. I hear it, as a testament to time and the city, listening to loss until newness breaks the surface, to be caught, held, and then released back into the flow, the shimmering green and brown of a balm and a churning that leaves calm and might as it settles. Sheffield in lockdown. The queue is a serpent slowly writhing into the supermarket as its hind parts bask pensively in the May sunshine. The kind faced man with a finger clicker holds us in abeyance as we are silenced by the unfamiliarity of distanced queuing. Shopping has become a high-risk activity, the point in the week of maximum exposure to potential infection, the peak of my fears. All the normal panoply of concerns have been driven out like gadarene swine by one great fear, both legion and imperious. 
I get my scanner and begin my traverse of the silent emporium. The disinfected trolley measures the gap we have to keep. My feet patter the one-way system. Then they pause as I wait for an old man to leave the cheese cabinets. He lingers. Then I speed on, ignoring items not on my list. I have no time to browse. My mass breathing is audible and odorous. I smile at the young couple with two kids and an unruly toddler, squeaking with delight and squalling with ire. Then I realise they cannot see my face. The mask covers any attempt to make a human connection. I move on and enter the toiletries aisle, looking for the right toothpaste. I scan it and hear the final beep of my sojourn. All this time I've felt a presence, only noticeable by effects. The masks, the antisocial distancing, the fear that stalks between our trolleys. In this labyrinth there is an invisible minotaur, a breath-born pandemic, and no way to slay it, and no Ariadne thread to show us the way out. And so the ordinary continues to be the thing that is most dangerous, and the hundred-year-old memory that we banished. As I exit the claustrophobia of the shop, I read the sign that says, Donations here for the food bank, and the baskets are full. Toft's Lane. Living down there was like living in a bean pod. One could see nothing but the bed one lay in. Cider with Rosie, Laurie Lee. The row of cottages nestles into the crag, in the same way as the child above me shapes her frame to her mother's hip. The buildings look down on me as mother and daughter greet me and my neck cricks up to take in kind faces and sashed windows. The dry stone wall, like a breakwater, keeps the cottages from spilling into the road my dog and I trudge daily. Grace's young voice, lisped by chewing an apple, is crammed with her new term. Mrs Green is young, there is also old Mrs Jameson, and on Wednesday after lunch, Miss Bankstone for story time. The daughter's garrulousness emerges from maternal skirts, cultivating the affinity of our gateside chats like tea in cups. To Grace's chagrin, grown-up talk begins. Her father, from a top window, his big plans that will eat their weekends. As the dog's lead strains against the current of our walk. Both this woman's grands lived in the valley, leaving a long drift of ancestral memory. From the planting of a line of lime trees to the paddling of pools, from old Matty's well to the quarry in Rivelling Glen. I tell her of a photo I found of our house from early last century, walls daubed with whitewash advertising teas and sweets for the Whitwalkers, a boy and a girl at the door in their Sunday best. The dog and Grace are restless, pulling us away from the richness of stretching our roots into this mill-streamed valley. This green backwater where we ply our subsistence, as it has always been, back into the horse-drawn past. In the last pass that a good chat entails, we share that the virus made us walk the valley more, 
traverse more of its paths and tracks, fall more for its green and shabby charms. We have both seen the barn owl as it swoops down Coppice Lane, outspread over us, cream and brown, at once lonely and at home. And the bat's erratic scattering progress, as the dust catches us unlatched and opened. And we find we are breathing in time with the valley, finding green hope in its sheltering edges, nestling in like a child to its mother's hip. Advent Blessing The winter is strong and dark You are in the depths of its silence Holding your breath in case you break what needs to be held with reverence The winter is long and cold You are in the grip of its frosts Its mists and sluicing rains let old thoughts fall from you like the final leaves of autumn. The winter is stripping and dying. You have no immunity from this season. It is a great teacher. Try not to shy away from the lessons that ache like chillblains. The winter is grafting and preparing. You are part of that story willing to be stripped back, to be exposed and vulnerable, to experience the new seeds de-husking. The winter will loosen and give way. You may walk into spring and know the joy of the newly born, fresh and excited by possibility. May you not leave this season until you are ready to allow the truth that you have found to blossom under green trees and flow from you like a breath from the green chapels and the light from the trees' regal cathedrals. Amen. Amen.